Good morning. I want to welcome you all to Smithville Brethren Church. A few things from the bulletin I want to highlight for you. First off, we have a group of campers headed down for junior high camp, which is the final week of our camping season through Camp Bethany. So we have the list of folks who are headed there, and we want to be in prayer for them and the, the staff as they work with them, and uh, that God would do the work that he desires to do in the lives of young people who will be down at camp this particular week. Also, Vacation Bible School is coming up, and so you want to take a look at the dates, get your children signed up, or maybe you want to sign up to help and be a part of making Bible School happen this year, and you can see the information in the bulletin. Also on the bottom right panel of your bulletin, you'll see that there are listed six adult Sunday school classes, where they're at, and kind of a little slight description about them. If you're looking for a Sunday school class for the next hour, there they are, and you can take a look at those and uh, feel free to pop into any of them and be a part of that. Uh, finally, this morning, I need to share that we got word that Hilda Flory, a long-term member of our church, passed away last week. So we want to be in prayer for her family uh, as we move forward today. Father, thank you that you are our God, that you have not only created us, but you have communicated with us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, and most of all, through your son, Jesus. Father, we want to have ears that are attentive, ears that are ready to hear, to listen, but not just to take in and hear, but to hear from you and then put into practice whatever it is you desire us to do. So Father, today, we just want to be open as we worship you today to whatever you would like to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy 4th of July to you. This, our Independence Day as a country, but this, the day where we declare our dependence on Jesus Christ our Lord. I would invite you, let's stand together and call each other to worship this morning. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. 
I would invite you, if you would like, to take your hymn book, turn to hymn number 636. We're going to sing, I Must Tell Jesus, hymn 636. Please be seated if you would. Take your copy. Hopefully you've brought your Bible. We're going to read from Psalm 130 this morning. So if you would turn there in your copy of God's Word, and if you happen to get off this morning and didn't bring your Bible, there are pew Bibles available, and you can pull one out. It's going to be page 969. As you're turning, just a reminder that the psalms are the lyrics to songs that would have been sung by the Hebrews over the years. This is a the lyrics to a song that would have been sung as folks headed up to Jerusalem for worship. Psalm 130, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. The preface is a song of a sense. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Please join me as we approach the throne in prayer. Father, we are grateful for this song of ascents, a reminder that to come into your presence, we must come with clean hands and a pure heart. And so our prayer is that you would cleanse us now. We ask that you would forgive us for words that we have said, that were impure, or things that we left unsaid that we should have spoken in the moment. We ask that you would cleanse us for actions that we did this week. That would not be pleasing, but also, Father, for things that we left undone. 
for thoughts that were impure or thoughts that we did not have. We ask, Father, that you would cleanse us thoroughly. We ask that we might be the expressive voice of the Holy Spirit to others, also encouraging them to come into your presence for purity. This morning, we lift up a number of folks in our congregation. We want to pray, Father, for Justine and ask that you would bring healing to her body after surgery. We would pray the same for Jimmy. And there are others who could also lend their voices, prayers for physical healing of their bodies. We want to lift up the Hilda Flory family and ask that you would bring them comfort. And there are others, Father, in the sanctuary who would also add their voices, praying for folks who also need comfort after losses. We want to lift up Andy and Sarah and Cora for a safe flight tomorrow. And others in the congregation could raise their voices for people they know who also need traveling mercies. We want to pray for Camp Bethany. We lift up our students who are going and we pray that this would be an amazing week of drawing close to Jesus Christ. And we would pray that some of those students would give their lives to Jesus Christ. And we know there are other churches that are also praying for their youth who are headed off to camp. We also, Father, want to pray for our country. And along with believers in churches across the nation, even sometimes across the borders, praying that you would bring revival, that you would bring health and vitality to churches, that Christians would be strengthened in their faith. We ask that we might shine as lights for Jesus Christ. Father, we declare that we are dependent on you. That is why we pray. We are begging that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us. And in this time of being in your presence, we want an experience with you. We want the Holy Spirit to be unleashed. We want your word preached in power. We want to raise our voices in prayer. We want to praise your name. Father, let holy business be done here this morning. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior and Redeemer, that we pray. Amen.
I don't know if you've noticed, but there is an interesting musical dichotomy going on in the worship service. This is July 4th, and so much of the special music has been a celebration of country. And then we come back to the hymns, which are an expression of need in the Lord. And they come together in the thought that our country could not possibly exist without God stepping in and providing for our country. I know we all recognize that in terms of our nation needing Jesus, but the question is whether you have sensed your absolute need and reliance on Jesus Christ. I would invite you, we want to take our hymn books again and turn to that need. It is hymn number 638. And as the children are headed out, we're going to stand together and sing hymn 638, I Need Thee Every Hour. Please be seated. I can remember uh, growing up, there we go. I can remember growing up, I, we would watch the ABC Wild World of Sports. How many of you watched that growing up or watched it? Yes? So you know the intro, right? Say it with me. The thrill of victory. Now hang on. The picture I have in my mind is someone raising a gold medal, but I'm not sure that was it. Was that right? I don't remember that one, but I remember... The agony of defeat, and it was the, high, the, the ski jumper who instead of going down and doing the, uh, off the side. Yeah, we were all fascinated with that, weren't we? <laughs> but we can remember that, That's that little, those little clips of people uh, injuring themselves, right? From the bottom to the top, from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. There's a well-known uh, Christian writer, uh, teacher, financial advisor, Dave Ramsey. You may have heard of him. Uh, you may have taken his Financial Peace Institute. You may have re read some of his books or been to some of the programs that are put on by, uh, by him or by others who do it on his behalf. Uh, Dave Ramsey teaches people how to get out of debt, stay out of debt, how to uh, invest their money, how to manage money in a way that God would instruct them uh, to do so, uh, and then he's applying that in his life, 
and you may or may not know that in 1988, Dave Ramsey filed for bankruptcy. How many knew that? Some of you knew that. Yeah, yeah. It's all part of the gig, right? We all know that, right? But some didn't, right? So, so he's writing now about how to do a great job with your money, but in 1988, he was the ski jumper. He was worth over a million dollars. He was 26 years old, uh, but his, his net worth was tied up in a lot of loans and so forth and so on, and so the bank called in his loans, and he had to file for bankruptcy to get out of it, and that, for him, was a turning point. That for him was the moment where he said, I am not doing this ever, ever again. And he began to uh, plot a new course, uh, learn how to live under God's authority in terms of his finances. And he began living differently and then teaching the things that he had uh, learned from the scriptures and, uh, and began to do what he does currently. And so we can go from the, the depths of despair to the heights of trust and uh, from the agony of defeat, we sometimes will move to points of victory. In Psalm 130, we see a similar move from the psalmist, who at the beginning is in great despair, great despair over his current condition. Uh, look with me, and we'll see as we begin that God's standards are unattainable, uh, and that is what he is despairing over in a sense. Look at verse 3 of Psalm 130, and you will read this, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? It's a clear expression of the unattainable standards of God's. His, his, re his requirements are so high that no one can achieve them. No one can sustain them. No one can live at that level. And so the psalmist is in deep despair over this problem he has of his own sin. The best of us, the best of the people on the earth, the most faithful, the most scrupulous, the most pious amongst us, all fall short of God's perfect standard. We cannot please God or measure up. The problem of sin enters, of course, in the scriptures with the two first human beings, Adam and Eve, as they chose to live in a place where they had every one of their needs met, physical and spiritual and relational, all of them. They had one rule to follow. They chose not to follow that rule and instead to disobey God. Sin enters the world, and from that decision, all humanity has lived in a state of sin collectively and individually. What the psalmist cuts through rapidly is the prevailing moral, moral relativism of our society. To say no one could stand is to say that in fact there are absolute moral standards operating in this universe. And additionally, no one measures up. When we as individuals think about our own lives, though, we, we like to compare ourselves. Uh, we often compare ourselves in relationship to sin to those who we believe who sin more than we do. And so we say to ourselves phrases like, well, at least I'm not as bad as Hitler, as though he is somehow the standard of the world. Or anyone else on the list that you might think of. Maybe there's a neighbor of yours you think is really bad. You might compare yourself to them. At least I'm not a serial killer. At least I'm not doing bad all of the time. At least I don't extort people. At least I don't do bad things to children. At least, at least, at least, at least. But this isn't how the scriptures work. What these thoughts or statements reveal is a failure to accept God's perfect moral standards. We act as though God grades on a curve. Now, Many of us have benefited from our teachers grading on a curve. <laughs> but that's not how it is. God doesn't say, well, this one's better than that one, and this one is worse than the others. God doesn't select people like we might select produce at the grocery store where we kind of check it out. How ripe is it? How good is it going to be? Is it the best of the bunch? Look at bananas and you look for the ripe one, but one that's not too ripe, one that's going to be ripe in the right amount of time, one that's not beginning to rot, it's too ripe, all those kinds of things. God doesn't sort of sort them out that way. The psalmist says, the best of the bunch, the best of the bunch fall short by making the statement, who could stand? God, if you kept a record of wrongs, who could stand? No one could. The sentence on us all is that we are guilty what we have to remember is that there is, in fact, a point of comparison that we have to use. 
It's not with other people. It's not with our neighbors or historical figures. It's not with uh, people who have been convicted of certain kinds of crimes. The one point of comparison that we would use in sin is God's complete and total holiness, his perfection. And that's why the psalmist says, who could stand? Who could stand against this? Who could stand up under this? Who would, who would be the one who would be holding up the gold medal in terms of morality? The answer is no one. It's similar to what Paul has to say in Romans 3. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? No, not at all, for we all have made the charge that Jews and Gentiles, so that's Jewish people and non-Jewish people, says all, we've made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. And then he strings together these parts of Psalms to make the case there is no one righteous, not one. There is no one who understands God, no one who seeks God. All have turned away and they've become together worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. In what we do and what we say, we are not living to God's moral standards. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their way. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. What the psalmist says in a couple of words, Paul lays out in a string of words. Who could stand? But I want us to notice something more about this. This is a psalm. A psalm is the lyrics of a song that was sung, either individually or as in a worship setting. And what we see in the psalmist's writing is a depth of emotion that maybe we miss. The psalmist begins and says, out of the depths I cry to you. The psalmist is so aware at a gut level of their own sinfulness. This is not theoretic to them. This is not something that is at a distance, but a real condition of their heart. And it drives them to cry out to the Lord. Imagine yourself, the the imagery is something like falling into a huge pit and then trying to climb out in a a wall that is unscalable, is so high we can't make it there. And so the psalmist says, I'm in this and I'm crying out to you. What we hear is the broken spirit of a truly repentant person. Beyond knowing he's sinful, he expresses how his heart is broken and there's a brokenness in his relationship with God as a result. He has displeased God and he He desperately wants to fix it, but what he knows is that he cannot. He's made such a mess, he can't fix what he has destroyed, so he cries out for mercy. The psalmist does not want to be treated as he deserves, rather he wants to be shown mercy. The speeder wants the officer to give him a break or write him a warning or let him off. He does not want to get a ticket and get points on his license. The driver might request mercy when he's caught, but he knows that he is guilty and is fearful of the punishment and knows he has done wrong. We know the guilt we have before the Lord. We know that we are well beyond the not-so-perfect standpoint. We are rebellious at times in our spirit. We shudder from the calls that we have to submit to the Lord. We know exactly what we do and should do, but we do the opposite and we choose to sin and give ourselves to the things that come our way in terms of temptation. And so we too could say along with the psalmist, we cry for mercy. Listen to Psalm 32. This is a Psalm of David. Psalm 32 verse 3. Again, speaking of this sense of of guilt at at an emotional level. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. The psalmist through various places expresses this gut level emotional response to their own sin. 
in the heaviness of guilt, it was weighing on David. Why? Because David loved God and desired to follow him, and David had failed God, so his heart was broken. He was distraught and distressed because of his relationship with God at that moment had been uh, troubled because of his own sin. And the psalmists help us to see the emotional side. The consequences of sin that are buried in our hearts, that brokenness, that heartache that comes with what we do. We say to one another frequently and freely in response to how are you doing, oh, I'm doing fine. But the psalmist expresses something very, very different. Think of the things that often get us upset. We have a medical issue that comes up, we get upset about it. We have a financial issue that arises, we get upset about it. But the writer is not upset over any of those things. He is upset over his own sin. And how instructive is this for us? But when was the last time we felt at a gut level this sense of despair over our own sin? Isaiah, when he was confronted with a picture of God's holiness, said, I'm undone. I'm a person of unclean lips amongst a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. I'm ruined, I'm wrecked, I'm totally dismantled. And the writer of Psalm 130 gets a glimpse of his own sinfulness. He feels the same. He cares so deeply about his relationship with God that he is disturbed and distraught at the core over his own sin. Picture again. The guy's been training for years to put on a couple of pieces of wood and slide down a huge hill and make an impressive jump. And instead, he twirls sideways like the rotors of a helicopter and ends in a crash. Defeat, despair. That's the emotion of Psalm 130. That is the level to which the psalmist feels his sin. And to me, it's challenging. When was the last time I was distraught by my own sin? When was the last time I I thought of my own sin and thought, ah, God forgives, it's not a big deal? How casually do we take this? The psalmist looks at who God is and says, I've been a mess and my heart is broken. And so he, he cries for mercy. But thankfully, It doesn't end there. Thankfully, that's not all of it, because you'd all go home very sad, and uh, we don't want that. So God's solution is unbelievable, right? That's the good news. The transition in the psalm comes from this single word that the psalmist uses, and the word is so simple and so profound, the word is forgiveness. Right? The writer is not going to make the all-too-common mistake of thinking that he can solve his own problem with sin. Right? There's no way out humanly. That's why he feels this great sense of despair. It's the bad news we must understand before we accept the good news that comes. The Bible says simply, we are doomed apart from God's forgiveness. So the writer's not proposing a balancing act of good deeds and bad deeds and some sort of comparison within my own lifetime that I've done a little more good than I've done bad, so I'm going to end up okay in the end, or somehow God will receive me or accept me because I've been good enough. I've I've not been great, but I've not been horrible, so I've been good enough. Like I've been a a C-plus student, so I'm going to pass. It's not how that works. God doesn't have a standard like that. The standard is absolute moral perfection, And not a single one of us can come close. And God's solution is forgiveness. God is not looking for us to make up for our sins or try to do a little extra good or be good from now on. God is looking for us to trust in him for forgiveness. His one and only hope as the writer of this psalm is God's character and God's willingness to forgive which, by the way, sounds very New Testament-like. It's the message of the New Testament. There's more clarity, there's more understanding. The psalmist can't call out to the name of Jesus, 
Because God hasn't revealed that part of what he's doing yet to the psalmist at the time he's writing, but he calls out to God knowing God is a God who forgives and who loves and who will forgive and restore him. But it all comes back to an issue of trust. Uh, a little over a year ago, we got thinking about replacing the vehicle that I was driving, my truck. Uh, wasn't really doing what I needed it to do. Uh, so I got talking with a friend of mine who is really into vehicles and a particular brand of them. And I said, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. Here are the vehicles I've been looking at. And he said to me, given what you do and how you're going to use this thing, you should go look for these kinds of vehicles. I mean, he gave me the years and the make and the model and said, this is a great combination of engine and transmission and so forth and so on. And so he gave me all this rundown. This is your best bet for the long term. It won't cost you a lot to maintain. It'll be a very good vehicle. They last a long time. And so I bought one. And I'll tell you right now, he better be right. Because <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> But it's a matter of trust, right? You go to, I went to him because I know he has lots of knowledge of understanding. I didn't go to him because he uh, somehow is um, a perfect in picking vehicles, right? We don't have that standard with other people. But I went to him and said, I know he knows a lot about these kinds of things. And so when he told me what he told me, I chose to trust that what he's telling me is true and accurate. And so I didn't bank my life on it, but I did put some cash on it, Right? <laughs> The psalmist is trusting in the Lord. And the reality is every single human being will eventually put their trust in something or someone. The world around us might say, look, Christians are too prudish. You're too concerned with sin. They'll definitely look at things that we would call sin and say, well, that's not sin. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Your friends might say to you, hey, everyone is doing this, which I found is almost never true. Everyone isn't doing it, but it's a great way that people get pressured into doing things that they know they shouldn't do, but we might go along with that. The culture says, we know better. The culture says, we know what is right for you, and you have to decide, will you trust our culture? Will you trust the people around you, or will you trust in the holy word of God? The psalmist says, I'm putting my trust in God's word. I'm putting my trust in the character of God who is going to do something unbelievable in forgiving me of my sin. He says, and I will, and in his word, I will put my hope. The writer's not trusting in his friends or what society says or the cultures that are around him. He says, I'm going to trust in the word of God. It is both his guidance and his source of hope. So then we ask ourselves the same kinds of questions. Who or what are we trusting in? When the world says life's about the accumulation of things, and we see bumper stickers on cars that say, he who dies with the most toys wins, who do we trust? Who do we trust when the Bible says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven? Because treasures on earth are, are susceptible to moth and rust and being stolen, but treasures in heaven aren't susceptible to those things. So don't store up for yourselves. Who do we trust? Who do we do? When the world says it's fine, in fact, it's functional to lie in order to get away from having to suffer the consequences of something you've done, if you can get away with it, then go ahead and do it. But the scriptures say, let your yes be yes and your no be no, and that we should be people who don't lie anymore, but always speak the truth, then in whom or in what do we trust? And returning to forgiveness. When your heart says, what you've done is so bad, God will never forgive you. And furthermore, if anyone in your circle of friends knew about what you did, they would never accept you either. When our heart says that, and we compare that to what the scriptures say, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Who do we trust? Do we trust in our heart? Which, by the way, the world will tell you, just be guided by your heart. Some of the worst advice ever written on a sign and hung in a home. Don't trust your heart. Trust your Lord. 
trust in his word? Will you believe that God's unbelievable solution to your sin is really believable? It's really what you ought to bank on and trust in. Not just for the very first time you come to faith, not just at that time where it finally came to you and you said, oh, I understand my sinfulness and now I confess my sin and I want to become a follower of Jesus, but all through the rest of your life, will you trust in him? Will you trust in his forgiveness? The psalmist is 100% banking on it. And it says he's waiting like a watchman waits for the morning. Right? The picture is like the night watchman who just can't wait for morning to come and his shift is over and the, the, the opportunity for people to kind of sneak in has gone away. He's just waiting, waiting for this to take place. But he trusts in God's forgiveness. God is willing to forgive the brokenhearted, even when we feel it's unbelievable. And when we struggle to believe that God will forgive, then we turn to other options. We minimize our sin. We compare ourselves to other people. We try to do the balancing act. Look at what I've done over against this other that I've done, and this is good, and this is not as good, but I've done more of this. We fall into those patterns of thinking when all we must do is trust in God's Forgiveness. And the final part of the psalm says this, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. The writer's not just convinced for himself, but for the whole nation that God will forgive and redeem them. And in the course of this psalm, the writer has gone from the depths of despair to the heights of trust in the Lord's forgiveness. He not only rejoices in it for himself, but encourages the entire nation to trust in God's amazing love and the character of God to forgive. He's discouraged at the beginning in the most, in the greatest area of importance of our lives, in his relationship with God. And yet his trust and his confidence is fully in the Lord at the end. He claims no part, he simply cries out for mercy, a cry each and every one of us could echo, for we ourselves need the cry of mercy. So we are here on this day that the, our nation calls Independence Day, a day where we're concerned with freedom, but the greatest freedom we could ever experience is freedom from our sin, freedom from our shame, freedom from our past, freedom from the controlling sin of our lives. May that be the freedom we experience today and every day as we trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word that reminds us of your amazing forgiveness. Help us, Father, to reflect enough on our lives to be broken by our own sin, that we might come to you and cry for mercy, and that we would find you, as your word says that we will. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have ever been in a relationship with someone and they have forgiven you for the unforgivable. It knits your heart to them in thanksgiving, and that should do the same for us with our Lord and Savior who saved us, God who has forgiven us. I invite you, take your hymn book one last time. Turn to 634. We're going to sing more love to you. Let's stand together as we sing in closing.
Father, we stand before you so thankful for being able to know Jesus and to know that he has given his life for us, that our forgiveness is not just something that we imagine, but something that you have secured. Help us, Father, to live in light of our forgiveness, to continue to come to you as we need to confess that we might experience your forgiveness and grace each and every day, and that we would do what the psalmist is doing as well, to then take what we know and teach it to others. In Jesus' name, amen.